Good afternoon. It's such a pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar. And for those of you that don't know what we are all about, our mission of the Michigan Energy Services Coalition is to support both public and private sector organizations in their effort to reduce energy costs while increasing operational efficiencies and then leveraging that into much needed infrastructure improvements. Today, we're co-hosting this webinar as an educational outreach to the markets that we serve. And traditionally, lighting has been cons a consistent con um, inclusion in these type of projects as they provide a greatly improved environment and also energy savings. So because of that, a lot of the markets that we serve and our customers look to our organization for expertise in this area. And we're finding a lot of the information is hitting the market with Covey ultraviolet solutions. And a lot of those seem to play with some lighting solutions. So we wanted to provide just a good factual resource of information to all of you. Our chapter operates in partnership with the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, or better known as EGLE. So I wanted to introduce Jake Wilkinson from EGLE to say a few words as well. Hello everyone, this is Jake Wilkinson. I'm with the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, or EGLE, as Nicole said. Uh, I serve on the board as the public sector vice chair for the Michigan chapter of the Energy Services Coalition, and I represent EGLE in that role. EGLE believes in performance contracting as a viable financing method for building energy improvements and supports its use in Michigan. EGLE is happy to have a part in presenting this webinar about germicidal UV lighting as organizations continue to find ways to improve their building's efficiency and create healthy environments for their employees. And since you're not here to listen to me talk, uh, I think I'm just going to thank you all for attending and pass it to Bob Hahn, who will be introducing our speaker. Thank you, Jake. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Bob Hahn. I'm the president of Lumicon, and we are a uh, LED lighting manufacturer right here in the great state of Michigan. Uh, we're very pleased today to be able to present um, our, our presenter, Mark Line. Uh, Mark is from uh, the Illuminating Engineering Society. Uh, Mark has a design lighting systems for, has designed lighting systems for a wide range of applications, including residential, retail, healthcare, and both conventional and nuclear power plants. He has provided lighting education, working, presenting, and teaching throughout North America, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. He serves on the executive committee for the 90.1 Energy Code and on the 189.1 committee that writes the International Green Construction Code and the steering committee for the Advanced Energy Design Guides. Mark is an active member and multi of multiple other IES, ASHRAE, uh, IEEE, ISO, and ANSI committees. He is a columnist for Lighting and Design Application Magazine, LDNA, writing on the changes in our industry, and he hosts a podcast on lighting trends and technologies. Mark served as chair of the National Electrical Manufacturers Association Light Source Committee and the IES Progress Committee and as vice chair of the National Lighting Bureau. He has attained his lighting certificate or certified, he's LC. He's credentialed and is certified lighting efficiency professional, which is CLEP. In addition, Mark is certified lighting management consultant and a lead accredited professional. He also holds the high performance building design professional cert certification as well. After two decades of lighting design and sales, Mark ran the educational centers for both Cooper and Hubble Lighting and was Director of Government and Industry Relations for Osram Sylvania, and he joined the staff of the Illuminating Engineering Society in 2016. So we would like to welcome Mark, and we will turn it over to him at this time. One thing to clear up though is it's, it's germicidal ultraviolet, but you don't see the word light up there because it's not light, because technically, light is visible and this isn't this is these wavelengths are outside of our visible range so it's germicidal ultraviolet but it's not really ultraviolet light and often you'll hear um, it referred to as light but it, it's technically not so you might ask yourself why is the lighting guy talking about something that isn't light 
Um, we do know more about this in our field in terms of the luminaires and the sources specifically, and even the applications that they're going in, because we know those uh, for being lighting, doing lighting design and sales. So we're a good fit for this, uh, for the lighting community. We've had a photobiology um, committee in the IES for um, I think at least 50 years. Um, so this is, this is our turf. Uh, even though it's a bit peripheral. Um, but isn't that the nature of lighting right now, that we have so many adjacent technologies that are converging and requiring us to know um, more than we have in the past to be effective at our jobs? Um, and I, I think that there's, there's certainly a lot of evidence for that. Just in the IES, if if you took that first IES handbook, uh, it's not much thicker than a Stephen King novel. But the last one, for those of you that, that purchased this, um, it's, you know, it, it's a doorstop. The thing is, is just heavy to lift. And there's just a lot more information. I was on the board when that was written, the last handbook, and the authors, and we had four of them, they just kept sending stuff in and saying, wait, this is important, and adding to it until finally we cut it off. And we said, no, we've got to get this out because we were late doing it. Um, lighting has expanded uh, terrifically into a lot of adjacent areas with a lot of convergence. Um, but this topic in particular is one of those narrow fields that could be valuable to you in a number of ways. Um, and for those of you with companies, you might be thinking about how this might apply. Um, there are some cautions involved, and by the end of this session, I think you'll you'll understand well what those are. Um, I, I, this is a uh, a dry presentation. Uh, that's because it's germicidal ultraviolet. But I, I got this picture last night. It was uh, almost midnight. A friend of mine who's pictured there, Darren Hoyle, a lighting professional, sent me this photograph. And this is, um, uh, this is his, his wonderful family. He's, Darren lives up in, uh, in Toronto, and some of you may be able to relate to this. Um, and if you're looking for the kind of break that I know Darren is based on the expression that he has on his face, uh, we'll take a little break together here uh, and talk on germicidal UV. History. Um, this is not a new topic. And it, obviously we're going back to the 1800s for UV radiant energy. It was actually 1845 when people discovered that um, light had an effect on bacteria. That was 1845. So by 1910, we were using it in, for water and by 1935 using it for air. Started with the surfaces back in 1877. And more recently, there's been a lot of use in the water treatment facilities, some laboratories that deal with um, you know, biological issues and shielding in HVAC ductwork. I, I, I'm on uh, six ASHRAE committees and ASHRAE is very involved with one aspect of GUV. And we'll talk about that as we go through. And that's um, when you take a germicidal ultraviolet lamp and put it open into the duct. Um, and then it can purify the air going through the duct. And there's obviously best practices for that. And we'll talk about those as we go through this. Um, Ebola prompted a new interest in GUV um, uh, about five, six years ago. And uh, now with COVID-19, we're looking at how can this be applied to help us uh, at this time when, when we certainly need it. Um, there are safety concerns, we're gonna talk about those, but they are, if they're understood, they're worth the trade-off uh, because of what GUV can do in some applications uh, to prevent uh, infections, and that's viruses as well as bacterial infections. If any of you are inclined to read more about the history of ultraviolet radiation, I put a link there for you. It's a very credible link. Um, U.S. Army um, uh, Center for Health Promotion and Preventive Medicine 
I have put this out and um, you can download it. It's free because it's a government document. It's about 30 pages on the history of ultraviolet germicidal. You'll know more than anyone else on the block uh, by the time we're done with that. A few terminology points before we uh, look at some charts and graphs. And this is not going to get uh, especially technical or geeky. Uh, if, um, if you want that, at the end of this presentation, there will be uh, links to a four hour, it's actually four hours and 20 minute webinar uh, given by the uh, six authors of a report that the IES uh, produced uh, last month on germicidal UV. And it does get geeky. Uh, so you want more information, I'm going to show you how to get that at the very end of this presentation. But I'll encapsulate a lot of the information that, that is in the report and in the video here uh, to give you this um, one hour overview. So germicidal UV, it refers to using ultraviolet energy, those wavelengths that are defined as ultraviolet, we'll look at that on the next slide, to inactivate uh, bacteria, mold spores, fungi, and viruses. Now, inactivate's a key word here. Actually, with bacteria, you can kill it because bacteria is alive. You can't kill a virus because it's not alive. So we have to use the term inactivate to be technically correct. Um, and you'll also see terms as you look into this field that describe ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, UVGI. That refers to the process applied in the specific application, um, but a, often that term is uh, not used because um, the word irradiation is often um, uh, equated to x-rays and um, there's concern about ionizing radiation. This is not ionizing radiation, x-rays in a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. But because of that public concern, GUV is an is a uh, is a, a acronym of choice. So we mentioned that uh, it's not light, uh, even though you'll often hear it called that way. In fact, a, a, uh, I watched a webinar recently, and the the gentleman is renowned authority. It wasn't an IES webinar, but he uh, he always called it UV light, and we did when I was working, you know, with some of the lamps before. But technically, not the case. So here's the chart. And what we've got, if you look at the top, that's the electromagnetic spectrum. There's that small visible range that we all see in, you know, somewhere around 380 to 400 nanometers to 700 and some nanometers, all in that range. And then to the left of the visible range is the ultraviolet range. And that breaks down further into long wave UV, that's UVA, we'll talk about each of these, UVB, middle wave, and you can see the wavelengths that define that. It's very specific, very well defined. And short wave UV, that's where we're going to spend most of the time now. That's UVC. Then there's another section called vacuum UV. We're not going to be involved uh, in that uh, area uh, at all. Within the short wave area, to the far left of the, of the area, 200 into that 200 and you know, 22 range in nanometers. Um, that's what you'll often hear referred to as far UV. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go through this as well. So sunlight produces all of them, UVA, UVB, UVC. Uh, and it's the most common form of radiation. I've got a little chart there that I grabbed from a, um, from a white paper on uh, tuberculosis that was describing these. Um, effects. And um, sunlight actually does a terrific job as an antibacterial um, source. Uh, one um, article that I read by a poultry farmer, it was a small, small poultry farmer, he, he actually did the slaughtering outside on sunny days. And that's kind of counterintuitive. You'd think it wouldn't be as clean, but in fact, the state came out to test and inspect his work and said it was the cleanest they'd seen. Um, the chickens would actually be, you know, at a, in the in the sun, and and uh, you know, beef jerky things like that were dried in the sun in the past, and it works as a as a sterilizing agent. So. Um, UVA, uh, that's the longest wavelengths, then UVB, then UVC, but they all have very different characteristics. 
Um, UVA and UVB, we're exposed to those when we go out in the sun, but UVC and some of the UVB wavelengths are absorbed by the Earth's ozone layer. Um, so we don't, we don't have those wavelengths naturally occurring under normal circumstances. Uh, but we can still generate those wavelengths uh, with uh, electric light. So um, the, the UVB, that's the one you've got to watch out for. That reaches the outer layer of your skin, the epidermis. Um, UVA rays have a longer wavelength. They get into the middle layer. Uh, and UVC, excuse me, I said UVB, but I got them in the wrong order here. It's UVBA. UVA is the one that's going to cause you the, um, the sunburns. Uh, and then UVC is almost entirely uh, absorbed by the outer dead layer and outer skin with limited penetration. Um, so let's, let's get into more detail on these. Um, I, I've got an Apple watch right now. It tells me the UV outside, and I'm looking at a very foggy day uh, here in North Carolina, is 2.0, pretty low. Um, but in late spring and early summer, when the sun is high in the sky, the UV index goes up. And at a UV index of 10, the duration to achieve what is called, and we'll go into more detail on this, a three log kill of bacteria, which means 99.9%, .9 is estimated at less than one hour. That's sunlight doing that. Now, is all ultraviolet germicidal? And the answer is uh, no. Um, the shorter wavelengths uh, kill the bacteria and inactivate viruses. So wavelengths in this um, spectral band called UVC from 200 to 280 nanometers um, have been shown to be the most effective for disinfection. But some of the longer wavelengths can work, but you've got to have uh, higher doses in order for them to be effective. Can UVC inactivate SARS? That's the question that we're hearing a lot. And the answer is yes, if the virus is directly illuminated by the UVC at the effective dose level. There's some debates about effective dose level. We know what the extremes are, so that's good. Um, but uh, it has to be directly illuminated, and that's a key here also. We're basically talking line of sight. Anything shadowed or wrinkled or whatever, it's not going to work. Um, and that's a concern. That's why you, you, you know, um, that's why it's very difficult to design a product that you could walk through, for example, and have the UVC be effective, even at a higher dose level, uh, because your clothing is going to have wrinkles and shadows and it may not hit all of you, even if you turn around, which I think is recommended by some of those products. So, it could be a good secondary source, but not um, one that you'd want to have um, to, to bet your life on, so to speak. UVA um, uh, doesn't have the effective emission wavelengths to inactivate viruses. Um, so when we look at their power, it's on the order of a thousand times less. Uh, than the low pressure mercury lamp. Low pressure mercury is what we use as the, the primary source for germicidal ultraviolet. And UVB uh, can be effective because uh, it's a shorter wavelength than UVA, uh, but in um, accidental exposures, that's where you run into the sunburn and, and delayed effects for the skin and eyes. Um, and that, that can be um, quite problematic. Whoops, whoops, let's see if we can go back here a little bit. There we go. All right, so how is it spread? Well, the World Health Organization says it's spread by large respiratory droplets. And those can be um, uh, indirectly, um, you know, enter our body through our eyes, our nose, or our mouth. Um, how about the airborne part of it? That's a different. That's a different issue, and the research is underway to determine the degree of airborne spread. Uh, early on in this epidemic, I heard uh, from someone uh, in Germany that was on the seventh floor of a building, and people were isolated on the seventh floor. 
and they were self-isolating. And on the third floor of that building, other people were isolating and they caught it. And they thought it might've gone through the air duct. That's being researched. We don't know that absolutely, but there is a clear concern amongst medical professionals uh, that the virus is airborne um, because they're calling for fitted respirators for healthcare workers. And that's, that's a pretty clear example. Very small particles of respiratory droplets could remain airborne for minutes or even hours. Talk about fear factor, uh, even hours. So how can we reduce it? Um, mechanical ventilation can do it, but six to 12 air changes an hour is recommended in general for air disinfection. Um, and that ACH, you'll see that through here, two air changes per hour. That, uh, that's a lot more um, air changes than we would normally have. So then you've got additional equipment, additional expenses and such things to make that happen. Upper room germicidal ultraviolet air disinfection is the primary safe and effective way uh, to, um, uh, to handle disinfecting the air in a space for airborne bacteria and viruses. But uh, you'll see the qualifier here, provided it is planned, installed, commissioned, and maintained according to standard. Uh, and think about all the lighting jobs you've worked on that weren't actually planned well, installed well, commissioned well, or at all, uh, and maintained. Uh, again, at all. Um, so this requires a, you know, this requires a lot more uh, detail and attention to get this right. Um, and that's why it says a knowledgeable consultant is, is recommended. Uh, so you can use HEPA filters and that's good. And they can certainly get a lot of these things. You know, a lot of these are in the half micron size uh, when you're dealing with some of these bacteria and things, and they, they can filter that. You can have these induct UV lamps, which we talked about a little bit already, um, but their clean air delivery rate um, is not all, it's not as high as the upper room uh, GUV is. Um, um, uh, and it's, it, it's, a, um, it's a matter of, um, only adding a, a, a couple of, uh, particularly with the room air cleaners, adding uh, a couple more air changes, not enough to get you to that six to 12 where you need to be to make sure that this air is actually, uh, actually safe. Um, so that makes a secondary approach. And let me get this clicker going here. So how does it work? Well, what happens is the lamps, these low pressure mercury lamps, um, produce light at a peak at about 254 nanometers. That's just what they do. Uh, you get the phosphor off these tubes and these, uh, most of the tubes that are used look similar to the fluorescent tubes that we use. They've got the same electrical connections on the end um, and they just don't have the phosphor inside and they peak at 254 nanometers. If they were perfect, they'd peak between 265 and 270. All of that's in the UVC range they don't peak exactly where they ought to be. That's that peak action spectrum, 265 to 270. But at 254, they're so close uh, that they're actually about 0.85% of where they ought to be. And it's a convenient source that is readily available, reasonably priced, and it's almost perfect. So uh, that's a fortunate thing. Um, and again, these, these upper air disinfections with this, um, they've been installed uh, for this over 70 years uh, in some applications in the US using these, these lamps. Um, what it's doing is it destroys the uh, DNA and RNA, it damages it so that it can't replicate anymore. And that leads to the death of the bacteria and the inactivation of the viruses. Now, it's used in medical treatment facilities. That's a great application for it, obviously, because we're concerned there about the, um, uh, the bacteria and the viruses, and we wanna control those. So these fixtures, and you know, I had a picture on that last slide, I'll go back to that. You can see how that's mounted. You wanna mount these at about seven feet or so, uh, but no lower than seven feet um, in, a, in a space, and you see how that particular one is mounted. 
And uh, they then will um, purify the air uh, up above. There's also some mobile units that can be brought in and those will do a good job of disinfecting uh, surfaces um, because the air handling is getting what's up above. But if you want to touch, if you want to deal with the surfaces in a space, that's a different unit. So you're going to bring in a mobile GUV unit, um, and then you could also have it in your uh, air handling ducts uh, as well. And there's some robotic units uh, that are being used um, in some hospitals, and they were used in China uh, for COVID-19. And those are also a possibility, but there's all kinds of cautions here that we have to talk about if you're having um, a, a robot system coming in. The purpose of that, of course, is that no people are exposed to it, but you gotta make sure there's nobody in that space uh, when that's done. Um, and uh, I listed three different ways that GUV can be uh, used appropriately for different purposes. Uh, and you can see the quote here on the bottom. This actually comes from a report that we produced at the IES in fighting a war, a single weapon's never used. So you probably are going to need more than one to do this effectively in some spaces, particularly those medical spaces. So UVC can be a secondary infection control measure um, for the germ deposits on not shadowed surfaces, directly exposed surfaces. Um, if you're shining the light up like those um, air, upper air disinfection units are, then um, they're not going to hit what's down below on the surfaces. So the airborne would be taken care of, but not the surface um, bacteria and viruses. So where viral transmission is highly likely, um, you may want to suspend the um, UVGI fixtures, the irradiation fixtures, um, on a suspended ceiling, aiming them downward onto the surfaces. Uh, but at that point, um, if there are humans in the space, uh, they need to be very protected um, with protective eye protection, protective clothing, and such things. And ideally, there'd be no one in the space uh, when you do that type of cleaning. Um, so uh, whole room GUV uh, safely applied in unoccupied rooms where entry is forbidden um, during the cleaning. Uh, so that's that's key. You don't have to worry about that with the upper air ones if they're installed correctly and maintained correctly. You can work in those spaces because the light is going up. It says louvers on it, directing it upward. It's not coming down on you. That means it's not cleaning the surfaces in that area, uh, but it is cleaning the air. So the airborne bacteria and viruses are taken care of. So um, how do we know? that they're taking care of. What's, what's the efficacy for deactivating these, these pathogens? And there's an action spectrum, which is just, you know, ideal response spectrum for an effect. And that action spectrum peaks at 265 nanometers, like I talked about. But that low pressure mercury lamp's almost there at 254, a little bit shorter than that, so that's good. But if you go a little bit further into the UVB, at 313 nanometers, I said it could still be effective, but look at the relative effectiveness, one-tenth of 1% 1 compared to that mercury lamp. So that's not one-tenth of 1%, 1 that's not a confidence builder. So you have to look at the wavelengths of the products when you're evaluating products to see where they fall. Um, and you know, if it's low pressure mercury, it's gonna fall in that 265, or yeah, 200, 254 range. Uh, ideally, it should be 265. So um, there's an exposure dose, which is part of the dose rate, right? How long is it going to be exposed to this and how intense is the irradiance? And there's a nonlinear relationship here. And this is where we get into that term that I um, had earlier called a log kill. So the nonlinear, and I, I, uh, this um, presentation will be recorded and it'll be available to you if you want this later. If anybody wants a PDF of it too, um, we'll make sure that that's available. So you don't have to worry about any notes on this. It's not anything that we can you know, necessarily digest all at once. But when it comes to log kills, a one log kill is gonna take out 90% of the bacterial population. If you double the intensity, you kill 90% of the remaining 10% 
which gives you a 99% or a two log kill, 99% of it's killed. A 50% decrease, a three log kill would get you to 99.9%. So three log kills, what you're generally looking for are more. And a 50% decrease, also not linear, it cuts the efficacy from 99 to 90. It's just conversely the, the, the same method here. So it's nonlinear. And humidity has an effect. The high humidity can be problematic. So if you're in an area with high humidity, that is also one of the cautions that you have to concern yourself with. So I showed you a picture already of, of what upper room GUV is, right? Um, again, installed correctly, maintained correctly, uh, it's, it's safe. Um, but it requires some ventilation. Yeah. Even without ventilation, movement through the space and normal convective currents in the space are gonna help. Um, but ventilation, ideally you turn in the air uh, in that space. Um, just to give you a feel for this, odor control and CO2, that's one to two air changes per hour to clean that. Now that's not a, a big issue. Uh, but air disinfection, six to 12, um, that's serious. And if you're looking at any of these portable units that go into the space um, and you look at the size of the rooms you're putting them in, uh, you've got to calculate this. How, how, how many times are they changing the air per hour? in that space to be effective. Here's a picture of the lamps uh, that, uh, and these are like a PL lamp, right? But again, no phosphor. Um, so they, and these UV uh, lamps come in uh, this configuration like PLs obviously, because you're looking at them uh, or in linear tubes. Uh, so th those go into the air duct and then typically you've got a window, either plastic or glass, which would filter out the dangerous UV that allows you to look in and see if they're on at any given time. Um, so in a, uh, you know, in a, in a small room, you might be able to pull an air cleaner in larger rooms. That's just not a practical approach um, for air turn. So these can be a, a good addition and they go in the ductwork. So you don't, you're not directly exposed to this except through a glass or plastic window. Um, and the question there is, you know, do the windows need to be covered when it's on? And glass typically will um, remove the UVB and UVC transmissions um, almost without exception. The glass can vary quite a bit. So it can, it can have um, an effect on this, but typically we think of glass as, as eliminating the, the dangerous part of the UV um, spectrum. Uh, if, however, your source is a pulsed xenon lamp, which is also a, uh, a source that you'll see used in some uh, germicidal um, luminaires, then uh, you do need to cover it uh, because of the nature of that pulsed um, lamp. Uh, no concern with upper air installations uh, because it's all happening above you, like you see in this illustration in the lower right-hand corner. So you see where the fixture is located, and then you can see the range of how the, the light's coming out. It's not affecting the people down below. Again, mounting height is really important. Um, and uh, you, if anybody gets into that space up above, if you get on a ladder, or if you've got a mezzanine up above, you want to make sure there's nobody up above that seven foot because then you've got a whole different set of safety criteria. Uh, but the way this is laid out, you could, you could function in that space. Um, one of the questions that we heard a lot uh, was, can we disinfect masks and surfaces with GUV? Um, and yes, you can do the surfaces as I described before, but not with the upper air. Uh, the surfaces are gonna have to have a direct source uh, on them. So it's gonna have to aim downward. Um, the uh, typical way that the masks um, have been dealt with is with hydrogen peroxide vapor disinfection. Um, and there have been studies showing UV disinfection uh, with high doses. Um, and there's some guidance available from the National Institute of uh, Occupational Safety and Health and the FDA. Uh, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health is part of the CDC and the FDA, and they've got some temporary guidance uh, on this right now. Um, the handheld products that you see, and if you go to Amazon and you type in germicidal lamp, you're gonna see a ton of these things. Um, 
they have wands that you wave over things that are supposed to disinfect them. And there's some little boxes that you can put your cell phone in, all of those kind of things. Um, the issue with those is uh, dosage and time. Uh, if you just wave that wand over an object, it, I wouldn't be counting on that to have, have worked. Um, it may take several seconds in each in distribution area that it covers um, in order to work or even longer, uh, depending on the device. Um, so there's a risk with some of these products. Uh, they're cheap, they're accessible, they're not regulated, um, but they could really give you a false impression of how effective they are. Um, talk about safety. Uh, yeah, I, I mentioned this upper room GUV at least 70 years. Compared to the UVA and UVB, UVC is almost entirely absorbed by the outer dead layer and outer skin. Limited penetration to the deeper layers where the cells uh, reproduce. Um, so there is a safety limit at 254 nanometers for UVC. That's eight hours at six microjoules per centimeter square. So that's established. Um, 10 minutes of summer sun exposure at a UV index of 10, which is, you know, reasonable summer UV index, uh, that's the equivalent daily safe dose because of the UVA and the UVB. Uh, because at that point, you're, you're, you're getting a little too much of that UVB. Upper air GUV installation, typically recorded at less than a third of an eight hour dose. So in an eight hour period, you're getting less than a third of what the maximum would be in a daily safety limit if you've installed them correctly. The human eye is um, most susceptible to the upper room GUV issues and sunlight because it has no outer dead protective layer. So you can end up with some eye irritations and things, but they're not long-term consequences. Um, those are uh, transient and they will, they will disappear if you get an accidental UV exposure. Uh, and I put a, a couple of signs here that I, uh, I, uh, I found too that you'd put on a, on, in a space. This particular one, if you're doing surface disinfection, you wouldn't want anybody in the space, um, ideally. But you certainly want signs up to warn people. So here's some guidelines and safety rules. If, it's, if you're dealing with um, you know, low-pressure mercury or pulse xenon arcs, they're a little bit different. But all lamps have some general safety um, requirements uh, that you need to deal with. Um, and I've listed what those are here and we've talked a little bit about them already. Uh, if there's anybody in that space, they should be wearing protective equipment. And then the low pressure, uh, low and medium pressure mercury. Medium pressure mercury isn't as common. Uh, low pressure is the, is the tubes and the PL lamps like we, we've talked about. Uh, medium pressure um, is, um, it's much stronger. We see it sometimes in water decontamination, um, but uh, it, it's not as efficacious, but because it's ultimately stronger, there, is, there are reasons why it would be used and trade-offs for it. Um, so if someone's in a space with, the, um, with these plastic or glass face shields um, over the eyes and face, uh, particularly keep the eyes covered, uh, special gloves, um, to protect your hands uh, and uh, full clothing to cover all skin uh, if, you, if you have to work in, in these areas at all. And then you want a meter, and we'll talk about meters too, and you wanna check that dosage against what's considered safe. Um, and then with pulse xenon, you can see that it's, it's, um, it's more serious. You're gonna be wearing welding or cutting gargle, uh, goggles. Um, a little more inconvenient than wearing a mask to the store, huh? Uh, so welding or cutting goggles to protect yourself from that. Now this is safety rules for air disinfection. That last one was surface, okay? Now we're talking about air disinfection. So with air disinfection, um, again, you've got the same kind of concerns for all lamps, but it, with upper room UVG, um, again, we don't have the same level of concerns. Uh, unless somebody goes into that upper space. They get on a ladder, they are on a mezzanine, there's an open second floor exposed, whatever. At that point, that's a problem. They need to be either in protective wear or get down below the seven foot level where these are mounted. Um, and then 
any air handling units, that's that AHU right there, any air handling units with internal lamps, you've got an access panel for it and you're gonna have some type of glass or plastic door so you can see whether it's on uh, at any given time. So eye and skin hazards, do they differ by lamps? And uh, yeah, they do. Uh, the, the low pressure mercury, uh, I mentioned that's, that's the common one. Um, and it can cause uh, temporary problems with the cornea and skin. Um, far UV lamps, and we're gonna, you'll be hearing a lot more about, I think the far UV um, that emit somewhere around 222 nanometers. They can be a hazard to the cornea. Um, in fact, those, those wands, um, many of those have an automatic cutoff on them so that if you're aiming them down, they work. But if you tilt it upside down, they turn off um, for this exact reason. You don't want this thing coming anywhere near your, your skin or your eyes or your face. Um, and we'll talk a little more about that 222 range and how it relates to LED for UVs uh, on some of these uh, upper slides. And then pulse xenon uh, arc lamps um, pose a potential hazard to the retina, retina as well as the cornea and the skin. Um, so you need to take precautions with those. But typically they're just used in areas where sterilization is common and people have a process for this and they understand how to use them effectively. Oops, we're bouncing around here. Lamp technologies, where are they? There we go. All right, so with the lamp technologies, there's some pictures you've all seen. This is a lighting webinar, so you've all seen fluorescent tubes before. Just imagine them with no uh, phosphor in there. Um, and then there's a bank of them there like you might see inside of a um, ductwork. So most practical way is low pressure mercury. Medium mercury, I mentioned that already. Water purification. Uh, there's just a lot more energy there. Even though the efficacy is lower, you've just got a lot more energy. Um, and LEDs and some of the rare um, gas uh, halogen type products and the krypton um, uh, chlorine uh, lamps, they have some very positive advantages in that they can emit light in very precise narrow bands, but they're emerging technologies. Um, so we can get into that far UV region, which looks like it's gonna have some, some real advantages for us uh, for deactivation rates. That 207 nanometer to 222 nanometer, um, those ranges are, are what we're seeing in some of the LEDs. And the deactivation rate's high and the effect on skin and eyes is, is still UVC, so it's, it's reduced, but there's not a lot of experience with this yet, and there's not a lot of widespread usage. So this, this is, technology's got a ways to go. Uh, UVC from LEDs, generally 265 to 270, um, and uh, we haven't seen the upper air LED systems on the market yet. Uh, there may be some out there, but uh, at this point, you'd really want to uh, get a meter and verify them uh, before you did a large space. Uh, to make sure that they're they're working correctly. Um, here's a meter. So you can take a look here at uh, at one meter. There's lots of them available. Uh, I think I looked at this one. It was from a large um, uh, electrical distributor and it was about $800 or so for this one. That's a radiometer uh, designed for measuring UV. Um, healthcare facilities, if they don't own one of these, they may have a cheaper one. There's certainly very inexpensive ones available too, um, but their contractor will come out with a calibrated meter. Uh, for those of you that um, are in uh, the ESCO business and you're thinking about buying a meter here, um, you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna need to spring for a calibrated meter uh, to be effective at what you're doing and, and to minimize uh, liabilities. And then what people typically do is they'll have uh, two meters, uh, calibrated meters. And one will be their reference point to verify the other one. So you compare them periodically um, and you use one out in the field until you send it in to be recalibrated and then you use the other one. Uh, I have a, um, my son-in-law uh, works with an ESCO um, and they're looking at moving into um, adding GUV 
to the product mix uh, and the expertise that they they bring to their practice. Um, with these cautions in place and with the guidelines that are in place in the CDC, um, that's that's viable to add that to a business. Um, you just got to be careful where you use it. It doesn't. It can be overused, and we'll talk a little bit more about that too. Um, UV and air ducts, there are ASHRAE documents on that already. Um, 185.1 and 185.2, you can get those at Tech Street or the ASHRAE uh, site if you want them, but that's for in duct work uh, for uh, germicidal ultraviolet in the ducts. And you should know that UV rays will, um, they've got some degradation that they cause for paints and plastics and air filters, which is one of the problems with um, trying to use it to uh, clean masks. Um, and it also, if you've got a hanging plant up in that area where you're putting the, uh, the uh, GUV upper air disinfection, um, hopefully it's not a plant that you like uh, because it's not going to do well there. Um, costs are always a, always a concern. Let me make sure I didn't skip one there. Nope. So uh, for this, I went to a, um, I've got the URL here if anybody wants to go to it. This is stoptuberculosis.org, stoptb.org. Uh, and they looked into URGUV costs. You know, these are going to vary. Uh, I mean, the cost for electricians varies tremendously regionally, and, and the cost of products vary and all of that. But when you see a breakdown here, you, you really get a good feel for it. Uh, they're saying that the estimated unit cost on a GU fixture could be $200 to $2,000. I've certainly seen them in the $2,000 range and seen them in the $800 to $1,000 range, but um, that gives you kind of a breakdown on it. It says unit cost of $1,000, estimated unit cost two to two. 2000 for their purposes here. They put one in at 1000 You can sure find them in that range. Then they get into life cycle cost. And for those of you in the ESCOs, you know that, that story, right? But look at the breakdown here, what happens. When you get to the bottom line, after you've added in layout and design and, and installation and all of those factors, you get to the bottom of this and you can see that an individual unit is costing you, um, you know, $13,495. But if you have 10 units, then that breaks down to about $4,600 a piece. And if you've got 50 units, then there's a economy of scale involved. Uh, so it, it breaks down uh, significantly beyond that. And it may be that some of this uh, isn't a cost that would necessarily be uh, your issue. It may be you have someone on staff that can do installation, uh, someone else that uh, understands layout. You may have a meter already. I mean, some of these costs may not be applicable, um, but that should give you a feel for what the costs are. And to summarize it, we've got airborne transmissions, okay, and surface-borne transmission. Um, surface going to need to shine the UV directly on the surface. Um, and that's the only way it's going to be effective. The upper air can be treated. So the airborne infection we can treat with the uh, methods that we've talked about. Um, so uh, I got a list here on a fourth method that we really hadn't talked about, but that's just to take an open fixture with a GUV lamp um, at a height over 12 feet and that'll take care of airborne and surface, uh, but ideally there'd be nobody in that space. Um, and if there are, then they they should be have their protective wear on uh, at all times uh, if they're in that space. Advantages and disadvantages. Um, got them listed. Uh, the advantages we've, I think we've talked about all of these uh, already. And the, and the last one, there are recommendations and guidelines are available. So you can do this. There are, there are guidelines to go by and they're from authoritative sources. Uh, and that's gonna help you too if there's any liability concerns down the road or any accusations made, uh, should you get into this field. Um, Disadvantages, well, cost is always a disadvantage. Availability, uh, when it says not widely available on a global basis, the cost is part of that factor. Um, not that anybody couldn't get them. Um, poor installation, human error, all things that we've, we've talked about um, 
already. Uh, there's also says limited global maintenance companies. Uh, and that's, that's a problem and an opportunity. So resources. If you go to IES.org and I put the URL down there to take you right to the, the page that you want, uh, you will find um, a webinar titled Germicidal Ultraviolet Disinfection in the Days of COVID-19. It's four hours and 20 minutes long. Obviously it's recorded, so you pause it anywhere, but it's four hours and 20 minutes long. And it features uh, six of the authors of our GUV report. And uh, I've got just a little screen capture of the report there also. You can download at that report at the same website. It's about 30 pages in an FAQ format. Uh, with a great table of contents so you can look at what your specific question is and go right to that page and not have to wade through all of it. Uh, and it's, it's written in an FAQ format. Um, so that report is available to you. Uh, we came out with that last month. And in fact, uh, the webinar that you see there, that four hour and 20 minute webinar, we had over 3,000 people uh, on that webinar uh, at the IES. So that was a, a record breaker uh, for us. Um, but there's just that much interest in this right now. And that report's been downloaded, I don't know how many times, but it even got covered on CNN. So um, this is, this is um, uh, all available to you. If you wanna, just a quick, um, a quick um, another hour on UV and visible light radiation, um, that's uh, a webinar that we put up last September or October uh, before all of this uh, madness started. And uh, that is also available to you. And we've, even if you're not an IES member, we'd love it if you, if you were, but even if you're not, um, we've made these available at no charge to everyone. Uh, so you can, you can access these. And I put a disclaimer in here, it's just right out of the report too, right? Um, but it, it kind of ties into the first question that, that uh, Bob had sent me as well. Um, and this is just uh, simply telling you that, uh, you know, that, what our liabilities are in terms of the IES. Um, but I, you know, I, in working with ASHRAE um, and with their experts, uh, it was very revealing to me to find that our members that are on our photobiology task force and um, committee, uh, the key members are, there, are the same ones that are on the ASHRAE ones because there just aren't that many people that really have that solid, that many researchers and, and people working in this very narrow field, there's only a handful of them. And uh, with that, uh, we can move into um, some questions. Uh, I have a couple of them here that were sent to me already. So it says here, stop show, okay. Um, and I see we've got, some things going on in the chat box here. All right. So one of the questions that I got, and it's an excellent one. Um, I hope my answer is okay. Um, this question is, uh, what are the liabilities of specifying UBC lighting, both health and legal? Well, you've seen that the safety concerns, uh, we've addressed all of those. And if you do it right, and there are clear guidelines for it, then you can, you can certainly create a safe application that won't prevent someone from suing you if you have a safe application uh, because that that happens right um, but you're on pretty good ground if you follow the cdc guidelines um, and the world health organization guidelines they're fairly clear on this and if you follow those you have a meter you can measure the exposure um, you're taking the appropriate precautions you should be in pretty good pretty good shape legally the health part of it's a different story. And it, here's the problem. And really it ties into one of these other questions too. Let's see, oh, yeah, here's the question that I got. And it says, are there viable applications for retrofitting public facilities with GUV for disinfection? Public facilities such as city council chambers, recreation centers, conference, meeting rooms, lobbies, waiting rooms, and confined construction, maintenance, repair. So, Regarding that, um, intuitively, this is great. It kills bacteria, it kills viruses. We should have it everywhere. But there's a downside. There's always a trade-off, and it's not just in the cost of this. 
um, you don't want, you only want to use this where it's necessary. It's certainly necessary and appropriate in medical facilities, uh, in biological research labs. That's critical. But to try to think about putting this in a public facility, imagine the liability there. It'd be staggering because um, in public, people behave oddly sometimes. And certainly we'll try to pull them down if they're on or whatever else. Somebody's going to try to turn them on. It's, it's just going to be a disaster. And there's another reason too. Um, if you um, go to the USGBC um, lead standard, you look at the well standard, they're addressing um, antibacterial surfaces, antibacterial paints, things like that. You can overdo this. Um, the problem is that these things that kill bacteria typically are indiscriminate in what they kill. And while we think of bacteria as bad, they're not all bad. There's a balance to this and uh, you'll hear people talking about the microbiome community, right? This balance of microbes. Um, it's true. Uh, in fact, there was research done at University of Michigan when antibacterial soaps first came out and they found that what happens is if you use antibacterial soaps all the time, they indiscriminately kill all of the bacteria. And what happens on your skin is that the, what's considered the bad bacteria reinfests faster than the bacteria that balances it out. That appears to be true also in the microbiome communities in our, in our buildings that we live in. And when I say live in, over 90% of an American's time is spent indoors. Um, and that community indoors of these bacteria and substances, um, they aren't all bad. So you don't want to indiscriminately kill everything. Uh, that's problematic. You definitely want these and they can help us in certain applications, but not everywhere. There's also a question here about outdoor lighting GUV applications and are they available or under study? I can't think of any uh, that are. Uh, at first, I had a tough time thinking of an application for it outside, but even then, uh, typically the way that we mount lighting outside, it'd be either unsafe or too high. Um, uh, is problematic. Um, so I, I don't know of that. I don't anticipate it either. And I have one other question here from, uh, from Randy at Cooper. And hi, Randy. I used to work for Cooper. Um, uh, in fact, our paths crossed there. And uh, Randy um, had a couple of questions here. He said that, um, um, uh, let's see, um, luminaire codes and standards and medical devices don't fully cover the applications that have resulted due to COVID viruses. Please address the gap and thoughts on bridging organizations rushing to make GUV guidelines to codifying bodies. Well, um, ASHRAE and IES are both doing that and um, we're working together. Uh, in fact, I had a call yesterday with some of our colleagues uh, at ASHRAE putting together with the folks at the IES and we share members on these committees. Uh, so I think um, that's partially my job uh, to make sure that the um, organizations that are responsible for this are working together. Uh, and we're doing that. And the people on our committees also are from the CDC, John Hopkins, Mount Sinai, the people that have authority in this space. Um, the risk of incoming GUV products that slip between the current standards that don't adequately capture GUV products. Imagine that. Uh, there are a lot of products that have slipped between the standards. There's not a lot of regulation in this area. It's evidenced by Amazon once again. Um, um, there are a lot of products there that are just downright scary. Uh, I don't know how you completely stop that. Education is the answer, but so are ethics. Um, and um, those are always uh, difficult in a, um, to completely um, capture. And it will be a while before we have regulations on this, I suspect, that, that would stop someone like an Amazon from selling them. Um, and it says LED and GUV because there's few... Uh, LEDs that can produce radiation at adequate UVC wavelengths and sufficient power. That's, that's a question, but it's really a statement as well. There are, uh, that's the problem with the LEDs right now is, um, first of all, we need more experience with them. We need some specific studies at narrow wavelengths. Uh, and then we also need uh, high enough power to make these effective. And Bob, those are the questions I had. Um, we're a few minutes over already. Do you have others? 
No, I mean, uh, I, we do have others, yes. Uh, <laughs> some of these you've already actually touched on, uh, but if you want to just recap again real quick, just to make sure that we did answer it, that'd be great. Um, and then some of these questions, uh, Nicole, there's some for you and, and also for Jake too. So uh, the first one here, and then I'll uh, let Michael, you'll do the second one. The uh, far UVC light, this type of UV claims to be human friendly. Uh, is this viable protective UV concept? Is, the, is it a new concept or is this years, decades old? What are your thoughts? Yeah, this far UV has been getting a lot of attention lately. We have a, um, a forum on the IES website called FIRES, and it's a forum for research, and, um, and there's quite a bit on there. Uh, as well. In fact, I've got a, a paper here specifically from scientific reports on, on far UVC light. Um, it's very promising. It really is. But um, we, need, uh, we need some more substantiation. You know, the, it, go back to the question on um, liabilities. Uh, we need some substantiation there. You can certainly measure with a meter, but we need some research done and we need some um, some authorities to uh, give us some guidelines uh, with LEDs, and we don't have them right now. That's why the mercury continues. In fact, you think about solid-state lighting in our industry, it, this is one of the last applications not to transition to LED. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense, but we're just not quite there yet. Anything else? Oh, yeah. yeah I've got <laughs> one more question here, Mark. So, so basically, you're talking about when you're talking about tubes, he says, basically, a T8 lamp without phosphor, what temperature do these run at? I'm seeing temps in the 1200 F range. Is that a different lamp technology? That's interesting. Um, what I, my understanding is that they're operating at the same wattages, okay, same electrical connections. Um, so wattage is heat related. So I got to believe the heat generated is, is proportionate to the wattage. So it'd be similar to a, a phosphor coated fluorescent lamp. Okay. That's on the low pressure mercury. The medium pressure, of course, you can just, you can just extrapolate that, right? Um, can we get a copy of this uh, slide deck? So uh, you've already answered that, I believe, Mark, that you're going to make a PDF version of it available and we'll send out to everyone. We do have all the emails from the registrants. We'll send you guys a copy. Okay. Of that. And uh, also, uh, you already mentioned too, we are recording this, so this will be uh, available as of probably tomorrow. Uh, it'll be up on YouTube and uh, Lumicon website and, and also uh, I can let Nicole and Jake speak if they're going to post it for too. Good. Are we at mission accomplished here? Oh, we still got more. Just <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Michael. Next, next question is, why does the UVC reflectance off the ceiling in upper room not create an issue for occupants? Is that a function of level of reflectance? And would highly uh, reflective ceilings be an issue? Yeah, yeah, um, it, it can be. Uh, particularly on a, a lower ceiling height. Um, reflectivity is part of the, of the planning stage um, and it's part of the caution. So yeah, it's a good point. Um, uh, once again, we just did an hour on this, right? We're a little over now, but we did about an hour's worth of content on this. Um, but to get into some of that level of detail, um, use the resources on the last slide. Um, and you'll find out more about it because they get into that in the webinar, the four-hour webinar. Thanks, Mark. Welcome. Okay, this question is for Nicole. Has the performance contractor market seen this kind of technology, UVC <laughs> project design prior, or is this topic of UVC just like COVID-19 fluid and new and still emerging? Do you see companies adapting and asking for this kind of lighting technology in the future work and design? Would it move into all facets in the mush market or is it all too soon to tell? So that's, um, there's a, a lot in that question. And in speaking from the Energy Services Coalition and the market in general, I think this technology, of course, as Mark has said, has been around in the, more specifically in the, used in the healthcare market. So we have seen some 
pulled into specific performance-based programs in the healthcare market more um, in the past. Uh, but we do believe that we're going to see customers highly interested in involving this um, and pulling it into possible projects, um, whether it be healthcare, municipalities, schools, colleges, manufacturing, um, any high use spaces, um, we believe that they'll at least be interested in looking at it. And ESC as an organization, we support our customers um, in the markets to help them get the infrastructure improvements that they need. And so if that's something that they really need, um, we would support pulling that into projects. We want, just wanna make sure that um, it's done with the right design and the right application as, as Mark had alluded to that it's done um, right and that it's needed in that application. Great, thank you. All right, uh, a quick question. Once a virus becomes inactive, Mark, can it be reactivated? <laughs> I would have said categorically no until COVID because <laughs> there's a lot they just don't know about COVID-19. Um, um, can you get it again, Michael? Once, once you've had the COVID disease, uh, can this virus cause you to get it again? Well, nobody knows, right? Um, I, I uh, based on precedent, um, they're there. You've destroyed the DNA and the RNA. They're not going anywhere. They're not replicating anymore. Uh, so, based on precedent, I don't think there's any way they'd reactivate. Um, but this is a novel virus <laughs> that we're dealing with now, um, and there's a lot that's novel about it. Uh, so I don't want to categorically say anything about it because we don't have any R&D. But based on precedent, if you're killing the RNA and the DNA, this thing can't replicate. Sure. Good point. Thanks, Mark. Welcome. Uh, this question is for Jake. Uh, Jake at Eagle. Does the state of Michigan, Eagle, anticipate using technologies to be formally introduced into environmental code and governing law going forward as a to address public safety? Or would that kind of policy update be handled by others? So building codes in Michigan are controlled by the Bureau of Construction Codes, which is in the Lic Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs. Um, those codes are generally adopted based on standards established by either ASHRAE or the International Codes Council. I haven't been seeing anything related to UV being included in those codes. Um, that being said, Michigan does have the ability to amend any standards that they choose to uh, before they would adopt that code. Generally, that's to remove things from the standards and not to add them. They have the ability to do either. Um, usually it's something removed based on a cost effectiveness judgment that's made, uh, but Long story short, I haven't really heard of anything being implemented as far as if it were to be a policy or law change that could be done by the governor. Um, obviously, she's been doing a lot of executive orders lately, so that is a possibility in the future. And then uh, the legislature could also, you know, establish some public act or something that would require it. So those are the only like policy um, levers that could be done that to my knowledge uh, and then like I said incorporation into a code would be more of an administrative change but I haven't heard about it trending in that direction at this point. And it'd be premature for that anyway because as I indicated with the with the GUV upper air disinfection which is what you know is being advocated of the of the options as the safest and most effective um, that uh, that technology is for airborne um, viruses and, and bacteria. And the research is still going on to say how much of the, the SARS, you know, COVID-2 virus is actually um, communicated airborne as opposed to surfaces. That research is still going on. So it might be a little early to put a regulation in place uh, mandating it unless it's just extremely cautious. Okay, we'll go to the next question, Mark. What about the pulsed xenon makes the UVB and UVC radiation able to go through glass? I believe these emit in UVA also. Does UVA go through window glass? The 
glass is considered an excellent filter for all UV. Um, the pulse xenon, I'm going to speculate that it's the intensity that's allowing it to be some issues. But there's also issues with the glass. What's the composition of the glass itself? Um, you take a quartz envelope for a metal halide lamp, for example, classic example. It's eliminating the dangerous UV until it breaks, right? And then um, it can clear out a whole gymnasium, make everybody in a gym sick if we have one cracked metal halide lamp in there. Uh, it's very serious. Um, so uh, I, um, I, I'm not going to say categorically because uh, glass varies dramatically, but the general rule of thumb is that glass will filter out dangerous UV. Um, but we see variations in the glass, so you have variations in effectiveness. Obviously, if you have a window display and things in the facing the sun and things fade in there, that's UV, right? Um, so we know some of it is making it through. Mark, along the lines of that, does a mirror uh, reflect the harmful aspects of UV by chance? That's an excellent question, Bob. I that have no idea. But I suspect that since it's reflecting through the glass to get to the mirrored, sur the, the, you know, the mirrored substrate on the back, uh, it's got to go through glass twice, right, to get to you. Um, so at that point, I would suspect it's filtering. I don't know if anybody's ever even checked. It's a great question, but I don't know. Uh, it's probably not an issue. Um, uh, why you'd aim these at a mirror, I don't know either. But uh, it's an interesting, interesting question to chew on. Here's another one kind of related to different types of glass uh, from your previous answer. But will sunglasses be sufficient to protect the eye during disinfection? Probably not. Um, and I'd say probably not because most sunglasses leave some gap around the side. And light can come in through that area. Um, and that's, that's a problem. You, you're going to want some type of wrap around product. And in the interest of liability, I'd use a product that has some speci specificity on um, what it's capable of filtering. So to buy a pair of, you know, dollar store sunglasses and think it's going to help you, I doubt it. Um, and certainly the gaps around the side are, are key. I'd be buying products that were designed specifically for this. I mean, welding stuff certainly works and there's lesser products that would work, but I, I wouldn't be confident with just an off the shelf pair of sunglasses. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Welcome. Uh, this one's from Cal Peters. Uh, how do you measure intensity of UV akin to the lumens in visible yeah. light? What is the level required for UV? Yeah, it's not lumen related. So we're dealing with a unit of energy in microjoules, but we're not dealing with this. And it's microjoules, you know, per centimeter square, meter square. Um, so it's, it, it's a different metric. Once again, we're dealing with a adjacent technology. Um, and the terminology is, um, is unique to us. It's not lighting terminology. So we're just not dealing with the same issues. Um, in, in, for example, we're dealing with fluence rate. Uh, fluence rate is, is um, a term that you, we don't deal with in lighting. I'm, I'm looking at, you know, four lighting professionals. Nod your heads. Are you deal with fluence rate at all? No. Right? Microjoules? No. Right? Okay, so you know this is similar to um, horticultural lighting, right? You're going to go into an entirely different metric. They're not going to ask you, you know, typically about lumens. They're going to, you know, you're going to get into the metrics that are associated with that field, um, and we don't have that that level of unification right now. So it's um, not a direct correlation. But the meter will take care of it for you. Thanks. Next question, has there been any consideration given to the effects of UV germicidal applications on, quote, good bacteria in the built environment, such as the bacteria that lives in the human body and is essential to effective immune development? Yeah, I, I, um, I attended a class on that 
um, year before last, uh, and they didn't indicate, um, it was a question that was posed by the instructors, and they didn't indicate that there is any um, differentiating the, um, the action spectrum for the various bacteria. It may be that some of that work has happened since, um, but uh, I don't, uh, most of it is indiscriminate. It just kills it or deactivates it all. Um, I, could, I could imagine, particularly with LEDs and the abilities that we have to have very narrow spectral distribution and spikes with LEDs, I could imagine that you could get to that point. Um, but Michael, I don't think we're there now. Right. I don't think we're close. Sure. Thanks. You're welcome. <clears throat> All right, uh, this question is, have optics been effective at focusing and increasing the intensity of GUV, whether traditional GUV sources or with LED, with glass plastics in the light path filter or in the, the light, light path filter, you know, quote unquote, uh, filter germicidal effectiveness, degrade those plastics or other concerns? Yeah, it would degrade the plastics, but I haven't seen it. I mean, these are louvered fixtures, right? So there's your optic is louvers. And when you think of a fluorescent tube, it's pretty hard to get a good optical control out of that, you know, um, source. It's, it's not a point source, right? Um, so, um, no, I don't think there's much going on in the optic field with this. Uh, not that I've, I've seen or, or read about. And Mark, to tag on to that, the, there is some LED optics that are coming out to be able to work with UVC, very specific type of acrylics uh, so that yep. they've broken down. Um, but again, to your point earlier, very much in the infancy. Uh, someone asked a question about the strategy of uh, lighting manufacturers using LED in this field. And um, I guess the bottom line answer is that it, it's, it's such an un, with LEDs right now, it's extremely unknown. Uh, they're in their infancy. And again, just starting to make optics that go with it uh, and everything else. So um, you're going to see some early adopters. You're going to see some manufacturers rush to market with some things with LEDs in them. But I think it's more of a to take a wait and see attitude on it. Uh, to see what's actually going to happen in that field. Well, wait and see is a little reactive. I'd love to see um, some of these manufacturers that are concerned with this and want to move ahead in this area, help fund the research to make it happen. Um, we have a, a research pool at IES. Um, you know, we're a research organization. It's one of the four things we do. Um, we have funding uh, available. We always fund with other partners. Um, if there's people that want to do research in this area, I'd be interested in talking with them. Um, but we need, some, we need some research uh, to substantiate this. And then you're on a much safer ground with your product once you have some statistically significant research to validate the performance. Thanks. 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 Okay, Mark, next question. Is there a recommended material for the face shields that are be used during UVC wand use? During a UVC what? Wand use. Wand. <laughs> um, most of you are familiar with Edison Report, uh, I'm sure. And uh, the editor, Randy Reed, Randy called me and he said he's been getting these inundated with UV product promotions, um, many of them offshore uh, products. And he's been asking them about safety and what they recommend. Um, and many of them aren't even, they aren't even thinking along the lines of safety. And one told them that they had a safety sheet on their website. He could go look at that, but it wasn't on any of their packaging. So um, I doubt very much that any of the wand companies have any specific recommendations uh, for what you should use with the wand. The safety switch is probably the best thing you're gonna, gonna hope for. Um, the doses are low. Um, that's why they tend not to be effective. Um, that's why they're cheap, right? Um, and unproven. Um, but uh, if you wanted to play it safe, put on some welder's goggles, right? Um, but 
yeah, I, I don't think you're going to get the recommendation from them because I don't, I think if, if what Randy's telling me is right, a lot of these companies just aren't, they aren't even thinking safety. Uh, this is a good question, uh, Keith, from uh, Jason McKay. <clears throat> if glass filters out harmful effects of GUV up to windows to view a view GUV system, how is a mercury lamp effective if glass is in the bulb or the envelope material surrounding the mercury GUV lamps? Yeah, now, um, it's a it's actually it's a great question. Um, obviously, part of the light is the UV is transmitted through the type of glass that's used in these low pressure mercury lamps because we know it spikes at 254 nanometers. So uh, clearly that glass is allowing that wavelength through. If you want to get into the technical details of, you know, borosilicate versus quartz and all of this and, and what wavelengths come through, I'm sure there's someone that has that information at their fingertips. Um, but I don't, I, I just, I, I can't answer it, except to say that it does work. We know where it spikes, we know what the effect is, but if somebody wants to know why it has that effect, I've got to believe it's in the glass manufacturing. The details beyond that, I don't know. Okay. Another question is, understand that far UVC isn't harmful to humans, presumably to the dead skin layer, but would far UVC still have harmful effects on eyeballs? Cornea, potentially, but it's, it's considered a transitory effect. It's going to be a problem for a few days and then go away. Uh, in fact, I think I've got a picture in one of the slides there of somebody with a, with a, uh, an eye problem from UV. Uh, and it's just a red eye. I mean, basically. Um, but uh, I gather it can be painful, um, but from everything I've seen on UVC, it's, it's transitory. Now, obviously, dose is going to have a lot to do with this, as well as duration, right? Um, so what's your exposure level, right? Um, that's going to have a lot to do with uh, how your body's going to react to it. Um, but the best thing is just, you know, upper room for airborne, and if you're going to do surfaces, try to get everybody out of the space. Gotcha. And use it selectively, only where it's needed. Well, uh, uh, we're, we have a hard stop at 2 o'clock. So um, there is a couple questions left. We're going to do our best to get to you individually and get you answered to those questions. Um, also on IES's website, there is a great document to frequently ask questions about UV. Uh, that that uh, how many questions are on that, Mark? That What's answering? that? How many questions are on that? It's about thirty pages. I've got a copy of it right here that I printed out, but we've got it as a PDF, so you can download it and spend all the time you want with it. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, so if you didn't get your question answered, maybe that's where you can find the answer to your question. Um, real quickly, uh, I'd like to turn it over now to Nicole, uh, our sponsor for today. And Nicole, is there anything you'd like to wrap up with and say uh, to everybody? I, I'm turning it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, just as we wrap up, I'll try to make it brief due to the time. But on behalf of the Energy Services Coalition of Michigan, we want to thank um, both Eagle um, and Lumicon for co-hosting this topic. It was extremely informative. Um, Bob, thank you for moderating. You did a great job. Um, and Mark, you, um, we owe you a huge thanks for taking what you said was a dry topic and make it very engaging um, and interesting. I think there is so much interest in this and you provided such valuable insight as to the facts. And that's what we are looking for to share as an educational resource what is it? How does it work? Where does it not work? How to safely use it if you deem that it is necessary in your facility? And so that was very informative. So thank you all for pulling this um, topic together to share. Um, if you want more information on the Energy Services Coalition, um, please go to our website for the Michigan chapter and you can reach out to any of us if you have questions or want to get involved in our organization. If you're interested in getting continuing education credits for today's webinar, 
Um, I believe you can self-report and now we're at an hour and a half. So you would be able to self-report an hour and a half of learning. If you need additional documentation, um, reach out to us through our website and we will um, get you some type of a certificate if you need that documentation. Um, thanks again to um, everyone that's on the call for joining us today. And um, I wish you all well. Thank you, Nicole. And that's it for today. So thank you very much, everyone. And have a thank you. Stay safe out there. Thank you. Bye-bye.